And the Lord laid it, laid it on his heart to start a ministry for street people in Clovis. A town of 45,000 people. So last year, in, in the year 2015, they sheltered men, women, and children for 8,438 8, nights all together. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people every night. They provided 49,556 meals last year. They clothed over 9,500 people in the town of Clovis, New Mexico. And they furnished 383 homes with furniture and linens and kitchen stuff. And Nikki uh, used to volunteer there, and, Tiff and Tiffany... When Tiffany was this big, Tiffany used to go over there and sort clothes with Nikki. And quite a ministry. And it's just, it's grown. They have one of the f most successful uh, crack treatment programs in America. There's a guy uh, in, that's well known in Clovis. He's, a, he's got a lot of real estate. His name is uh, Geesey, Mr. Geesey. Uh, we used to buy land from him to build houses, and he's very eccentric. He used to have this little, I can't forget, he had a, a Toyota station wagon, and in the console in the middle, he had this little pyramid made out of toothpicks. And he'd be driving along, and he'd pull out one of those toothpicks, and he'd mess around with it for a while, and he'd stick it back in there, and then he'd pull out another one. He was, he was, he was eccentric. But he was, he, was very, he, was, he was very intelligent and he was very wealthy. So nobody cared about how eccentric he was. But he had a beautiful 40-acre uh, home on a ranch with an apple orchard. And he sold, he wanted, he wanted over a million dollars for the property and it was worth it. He, he gave it to the Lighthouse Mission for like two, uh, $200,000. The rest he wrote off. And he gave him like 50 years to pay it. And they don't even like ten thousand dollars a year. So you know, you never know what God's going to do. And uh, Richard, his entire family, uh, his, his kids used to come to the our, our high school, our Clovis Christian schools, and uh, his entire family is involved in the ministry, from the littlest to the biggest, and uh, they're quite a group. And he's quite a guy. He's uh, he's a good man of God. So, for tonight's lesson, let's, let's just go back just a little ways, okay? Things only God can do. Things only God to do. And if you don't have an outline, there's still some back there. It's just a one-page outline tonight. Anybody needs one? Raise your hand. One up here in the front. Is there any left? Yeah. Uh, right behind you. Oh. You'll have to share. Is there any left? Ah, there's one. They still got one. They got one. Okay. So things only God can do. Okay? God draws people to himself. He causes people to seek after him. He reveals spiritual truths. He convicts the world of, guilt, of their guilt regarding sin. He convicts the world of righteousness. And he convicts the world of judgment and uh, So, when you read those things, how can you how can you find uh, how can you find out when God is doing those things? What do you think are some of the ways that you can be uh, you can be illuminated to God doing those type of things in people's lives? If God, is if God is attempting to draw somebody to you, what do you think they might say to you? Or somebody to him, not to you. If God is attempting to draw somebody to him, what do you think they might say to you? Where do you, where do you go to church? Or how about... Okay, what is the meaning of life? That's a big one. That's a broad one. How about... Uh, do you really believe in the Bible? How about uh, my uh, 
my, my teenage daughter, does, we don't speak to each other anymore. Uh, my wife's mad at me. Uh, she's getting ready to divorce me. Uh, you know, when you talk to people, you have to, you have to be attuned to the idea that more important sometimes than what they say is the spiritual aura that surrounds them. And I'm not getting mystic with you or anything. All I'm talking about is you have to listen to them with a spiritual ear. Yeah, Gordy. Amen. 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 Okay. Okay. So they're, they're kind of overdosed on pain. Yeah, on emotion. So that, that's very good. Thank you, Gordy. So when somebody expresses something like that to you, uh, how can you respond where you open a door so that you can minister to them? Because if we believe that God is working around us all the time and that he has always said something for us to do, and the, if these are definitively things that God does, draw people to himself, cause people to seek him, reveals truths, convicts people of guilt, convicts of righteousness, convicts, of, uh, convicts with judgment. If those are things that God's doing, and when you hear those words, what are things that you can then say to those people that will, uh, that will validate for you, first of all, that God is working in their lives, and secondly, will open the door for you to be used of God in that person's life. Larry? Okay. Share a testimony. How about something as easily, easy as, can I pray for you? Or, can I pray with you? Like right now? Okay. Uh, asking them if they want to talk about it? Okay. You know, availability uh, is important when uh, people are in trouble. Caring about them, yeah. Amen. Yom. Yes, Arlene. Other things, you, you can ask people, uh, you know, do you think God's working in your life? Uh, do you know the Lord? Uh, not, a, not in an accusing way, but just in an inquisitive way. Uh, do you believe that the Lord is trying to tell you something? Do you, do you believe that your burdens are from the Lord? Uh, you know, because I've had lots of people tell me, you know, uh, I don't really be able to believe in the Lord, but there's some things going on in my life that, you know, uh, I, I'm not able to explain. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, I've, been, uh, I've been doing a lot more counseling on my computer with people that are in different geographic locations. And uh, uh, you, ex you see that more often uh, where people... Uh, there's a lot of things out there for people to believe today. A lot of alternatives to the basic belief of Christianity. And a lot of those people have a lot of questions when some of those alternatives don't work quite the way they might want them to work. So, uh, so there, there are... And what do you think... What do you think your... What do you think your point should be if you encounter somebody that doesn't know the Lord? Where are you, where are you going to try to take them? 
Okay. You're going to try to get them to a point where the spirit can convict. Okay? And however that works. You know, Marsha was talking about this lady today. And uh, however that works. And for some people, you can be bolder. For some people, you have to be, you have to be uh, gentler. But if you, if you, you know, uh, when you encounter those type of situations, when you're sure, when people ask you spiritual questions, they're only asking you a spiritual question for one reason, because God has prompted them to ask, okay? Because he seeks them out. We don't seek them out. He seeks them out, okay? So, uh, if, if, uh, when you look at that list of things only God can do, whenever you encounter any of those type of things, you want to make sure that you are attuned to what's going on and that you, 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 you need to respond to that person as, in the best way you can because that is a prime opportunity to get alongside what God is doing. Now, if God's... If God's going to have that person saved, is, is, he, 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 that person's going to get saved irrespective of what you do. But if he's given you that opportunity, boy, it sure is nice to be, to be the instrument that he uses to do that, okay? And, you know, and then it's, and it's so important when you want to know what God is doing, when you're seeking God, it's so important for you to be actively engaged in a good prayer life, okay? Because even at the point of meeting somebody and them saying something to you, you still have the opportunity to say a prayer. Lord, be with me. You say it to yourself. Help me. Put your words in my mouth. That's enough. And then, when, and then hopefully if that door becomes ajar and you're able to follow up with that pe person, you'll, you can see, you can go back to the Lord and offer more prayer up to him so that uh, you can see where else he wants you to go. Because God, I believe God, I firmly believe that God will connect your prayers when you're seeking his will to what he wants you to do, as long as you're in his will. Now, if you're praying for what you want, forget it. But if you're praying for what he wants, uh, I think God will God will show you what He wants you to do, and He'll and He'll help you with asking questions. You know, the uh, almost all all listen, all successful. You know, I've I've taught faith. Uh, I've, I've taught uh, Cahill, the one thing you can't do in heaven. All of your basic successful evangelism programs are based around the premise of asking the right questions. Okay? What's the one thing you can't do in heaven? Well, you can't witness to anybody in heaven. You, you, well, but you should, you should take care of that business now. <laughs> you should be witnessing to people now. And faith is, faith is much the same way. It, it's, it has a, a chain of questions that you ask somebody when you come in contact with them and, and you, by... Uh, asking those questions, you you get their responses, and then you have a series of responses to their responses. So, be ready, because you may have an idea of what you're supposed to do, but when you pray, oftentimes you'll find out that the Lord wants you to adjust what you think you're supposed to do. Right? Remember, you may have a crisis of belief. You may have to change something that you would normally say in a certain way. You know, the Roman road doesn't speak to everybody. It's a good scriptural reference to take people down, but it doesn't always speak to everybody. What's more important is that they, they, that they understand the atoning work of Christ, and that's part of the road, Roman road. But it's important that you be attuned to what God wants you to do. So two more, point, two more points right here, and then... Uh, We'll, we'll try to move on. When God speaks, when God speaks to you, uh, he's about to accomplish his purpose. And by that I mean when God reveals to you what he's doing, you need to respond. Okay? 
he speaks when he, uh, God, I, I'm not familiar anywhere in scripture where God speaks and says, wait. I might be able to find a couple places, but usually when God speaks, even, even in the instance of Moses, God spoke and Moses had to do something. He had to take an action, okay? And that, uh, uh, even when God spoke to Abram, even, the compo- even though the completion, the accomplishment may have been many, many me- years ahead, God was still telling Abram, you need to do these things, okay? You need to be, because oftentimes those things you need to do are the adjustments that God needs to change you, your life, all right? The way he needs to mold you, needs to knock some rough corners off you. So when God speaks, you need to be ready to respond. Not on your timetable, but in, your, in his timetable, he may need to prepare you. You know, I've told you, when I got saved, when I put my head on that pillow last, that night, I felt that the Lord was saying, you need to be a pastor. How long did it take? 20 something years. So I guess there was a lot of molding and roughed edges and stuff like that to knock off. So, And then the other thing I wanted you to remember is what God initiates, whatever God starts, he finishes. All right? And that's kind of, uh, kind of. if you look in Isaiah 46, you'll see. Uh, it says, what I have said, that I will bring about what I have planned, that I will do, 46, 11. So when God starts something, God's going to finish it, okay? And when God speaks, uh, when God speaks, he makes a guarantee. And that's the only person, that's really the only one you, that you can trust, that when they speak something, whatever they speak is, is going to be true. But it holds, it holds, when God speaks, it holds enormous implications to individuals like us. When God speaks to a believer, is it important? Yeah. When God speaks to a church, is it important? When God speaks to a denomination, I believe God speaks to denominations, is it important? How many denominations have quit listening? You know, if you're going to have homosexual... uh, marriages in your church, if you're going to have uh, women in the pulpit, if you're going to do all these things, uh, that's that's indicative of people that have quit listening. But uh, when you come to God, know what he, uh, God will let you know what he wants to do and where he wants to do it. And in that you can find assurance, okay? So I got this question on your outline. It just says, uh, do you agree with the following statements? What God initiates, he always completes. And of course, you, you agree with that. And uh, because if you understand the scriptures, God is a completer of what he starts. And, uh, there's, and there's, a le- there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain warning here. Uh, if you're a leader, uh, it's important. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to say, I got a word from God. Well, I tell you what, if you say you got a word from God, you better make sure you got a word from God. Because uh, uh, that, that would be, if you didn't have a word from God, that you could probably classify that as blasphemy. That, that would be, uh, that would be uh, uh, something you wouldn't want uh, to find yourself saying if it wasn't true. Uh, because, listen, if you have a word from God, okay, and God finishes everything he starts, and if it doesn't happen, what's the, what's, what does that say? God failed. So, you know, I've always been, before I've stepped into ministries, I've always been scared to death. And I'll tell you the truth, I'm still scared to death in this ministry. Because I, 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 I believe it's a, a very large responsibility. 
and it's a very it's it the uh, and I take I take that responsibility very seriously. And whenever you work for the Lord, in whatever capacity you work, it's it's an awesome responsibility. And if 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 He places something in your heart and on your mind, if it's from Him, it should it should live itself out to its fruition. Uh, prophets in the Old Testament, are you familiar with any prophets who, who prophesied, prophesied falsehoods? Those were false prophets, but were any of the, the true prophets? All of the true prophets were correct how often? 100% of the time. Okay? Just like God's word. So uh, when, when you, if you're going to say that or if somebody else says that to you, Make sure they understand what they're saying, okay? So let's go on to the next subject. That kind of finishes that, uh, that, that subject area. I want to talk about how God speaks in different ways. And uh, it's a critical uh, point to understand and, and, uh, and, and, ex and to understand and experience God it's a critical point to, to, to know clearly when he's speaking, okay? It's also critical to know when he's not speaking. But uh, we want to focus our attention on how God speaks. And remember, we started that way back. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, okay? And uh, the Bible prayer, circumstances, church, fellow believers. And when he speaks to us, he reveals himself, his purposes, and his ways. And in the Old Testament then, uh, I want to I wanna talk to you how God spoke in the Old Testament. Hebrews, somebody look at Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers, to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. And, and, there, and the, God spoke very diversely in the Old Testament. Genesis 16, uh, angels. Genesis 15, uh, visions. Genesis 28. Dreams. God spoke with the Urim and the Thummim. Remember those things that the priest wore? Yeah, Urim and Thummim. Thum, thummim. God spoke through symbolic actions. If you looked in Jeremiah 18, you might see that. God spoke with a whisper in 1 King 9, 12. And he spoke, of course, by miraculous uh, signs, miracles, uh, like in Exodus. So, but the crucial part isn't how God spoke. The crucial part is that he spoke. Was there anybody in Scripture you think that God spoke to and they didn't know that he spoke? Can you think of anybody? <laughs> the, well, he was... <laughs> well, that's a convoluted story right there. But the, the, most, impo <laughs> the most important thing is not how God speaks, it's that God speaks, okay? Yes. Yes, you can. I think you can. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, because it doesn't matter how God speaks. It only matters that he speaks. But in the Old Testament, those are the, uh, 
In the Old Testament, when God spoke to a person, they, they knew two things. It's in your outline. The first thing they knew was it was God. And the second thing they, they, they knew, they knew what he was saying. Okay? And we're going to look at that a little bit. We'll expound on that here. So God spoke to people. That he spoke is more important than how he spoke. And when he spoke, the person always knew God was speaking, and he knew what God was saying. And, and I, I want to look at these. There's four factors, uh, and they're broken down, uh, the most important to the fourth most important. The first, most, uh, the first factor, uh, the, most, the most important factor in the way God spoke to individuals is that God speaks to everybody uniquely. And this is an important thing to understand. When Moses had the burning bush experience, did Moses have a precedent? Had God sent burning bushes to other people before him? It was a totally unique experience. Uh, he couldn't say, oh, wow, that's, that must be my burning bush experience, just like Abram had and Jacob and all, Isaac and everybody else. You know, When God spoke to Moses, he spoke to him in a totally unique way because God wants your experience to be God, with him to be what? Unique. He, 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 he formed you, right? He... It, it, uh, you have an essence of him in his life and he knows exactly how to touch you and to speak to you. And he, he, wants, he wants you not to depend on a method. That mean, For me, that means a book or a technique. For me, that means another book. He wants you to depend on a relationship. Okay? Moses, you know, if Moses was alive today, I can guarantee you, if he was alive today, he would write a book, My Burning Bush. And then everybody would be running around looking for burning bushes. And that's one thing I've never understood. When people have personal experiences and got with God and then they write a book about it and then everybody wants to have the same personal experience, well, that ain't going to happen. At least not the way I understand the way God works. Yeah. He did it differently. Yeah, he did it differently. Exactly. Good point. So... Uh, it's important that we understand this idea of uniqueness, okay? The, and again, the key point is not how God spoke, but that he spoke. And he will speak to his, you know, God's going to speak to you today just the way he wants to speak to you. I have felt in my life that God has spoken to me. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean... Uh, it, it felt like it was verbal, but if it felt like he was right there three times. Three times in 25 years. That's all. That's it. Three times. Where I felt that he was, that I was, that he was actually speaking to me in a relationally, relation way where I could actually feel his presence and actually hear his words. Okay? So the first thing, the most important factor to understand about this process is that God speaks to you uniquely. The second one. Uh, when God speaks, the person has no doubt that God's the one talking. Okay? No doubt. What, what, what God spoke to Moses, he spoke to him in a unique way, and Moses was, not, was in no way... Moses knew who he was talking to, okay? Uh, the scripture testifies that Moses had no question 
that he was having a God encounter, okay? Exodus 3.14, he's, he doesn't say, he says, well, what, who am I supposed to tell him sent me? He knows it's God. He just wants to know what words should I tell him <laughs> that you're telling me to tell them, okay? Moses, because of that encounter, trusted, obeyed, and he experienced God just as God said he would experience him. So Moses, uh, 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 Moses could, now could Moses go back to the people in Israel and, and logically prove to them that he had spoken to God? Nope. Nope. He didn't have a photograph. He didn't have an autograph. He didn't bring back a remnant, uh, a relic that God gave him to show, show him this. No. But, but Moses had enough faith that he was willing to testify about his encounter with God. And God works that way in the lives of people. When God, when God speaks to you for you to experience him, you will have no doubt it's him, and he will, he will place his words on your lips so that he might have a testimony to other people. I think about Gideon. Gideon had a lot of faith issues. And, but God would, <laughs> and God was very patient with Gideon. God would reveal some of himself to him, and Gideon would say, hey, Gideon would be all right for like 10 or 15 seconds, and then he'd start, he'd, he'd start falling back, and God would reveal a little bit more, and a little bit more. You know, uh, uh, and that's and and that's the way God cares about us enough that ultimately, in Judges six twenty one, it speaks about Ah. He says, Gideon says, Ah, sovereign Lord. And then he says, I have seen the face of the Lord. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He says, he was convinced. Now it took him a little while to get there. But God was sure, uh, Gideon was sure, ultimately, that he spoke to God. So the second important factor in the way God spoke in the Old Testament is that uh, people were sure that God was speaking. The third one, the third and fourth one aren't too long. Third one, they knew. So they, when God spoke, the person knew what God said. There was no uh, amb ambiguity Moses knew it was Moses knew Moses may not have liked it, but he knew exactly what God was telling him. You got to get my people out of Egypt, and then he started to make excuses. But he yeah yeah that's the uh, a manifestation of the Shekinah glory of God. That's in my sermon on Sunday morning when you hang out with God. When you hang out with God, you get lit up like a light bulb. That's why, you know, I'm talking about Easter. That's why that angel, what, what does it say about the, the angel? His countenance, you know what countenance means? It means his face was like lightning. Because angels hang out with God. So if you hang out with God, yeah. Yeah, Moses, it was obvious who Moses had been talking to. And uh, so when God speaks, uh, you're going to know what he says. You're going to know what he wants. That was true for Moses. It was true for Noah. It was true for Abraham, Joseph, <laughs> David, Daniel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So the third important factor when God spoke in the Old Testament, they knew what he was saying. And then the last thing is when God speaks, that is an encounter with God. Sometimes I think people have a, a God encounter and they, they're waiting for something else to happen. And that's a shame. If Moses had, had experienced the burning bush and turned around and said, I wonder what else God has in store for me, what would have happened? You know, when God speaks, you have to understand it's time for you to come under his, to be subject to him and encounter what he has to you as he reveals his truth to you, okay? God wants you to experience his presence in your life, 
and you have to be present for you to experience that presence. Okay? So, when God spoke in the Old Testament, that was an encounter with God. When God speaks to you through his Holy Spirit, through the Bible, through prayer, circumstances, through your church, you come to know that it's God, and you'll know what he's saying, and when he speaks to you, that's an encounter. Now, in recent church history, uh, there, has, there has been a, a, a theology that I believe is expressed in regards to this, which is a wrong pattern. People will say something like this. Lord, I really want you to, I really want to know your will my, in my life. Stop me if I'm wrong and bless me if I'm right. And another version of that is, Lord, I will proceed in this, this direction. Close the door if it's not in your will. And the problem I have with that is I don't, think, I don't see it as being scriptural. You know, when you decide you're going to do something, you base your decisions on what? Your ex no, when you decide. You're basing it on your experience. And your experience shouldn't be a guide. You cannot allow yourself to be guided by things like tradition, things like methods, things like formulas. And often people trust in these things because, listen, it's easier. It's easier to to follow a formula than it is to have faith. You know, how many books is there on how to grow a big church? How many? If they, all, if they all worked, every church would be a big church. I don't know. I, and I, I tell you, I, and I've worked for, God, for people that they were more preoccupied with growing the church than they were in preaching the gospel and that's that's a place where I don't think you want to be you know if you base your what you think the Lord wants you to do on your experience you're really doing what you want to do okay and what happens when it doesn't work again what happens who do you blame do you blame yourself or do you blame God you know uh, so uh, it's important that we uh, that we let the Lord lead and not get in the way. The Word of God. Listen, if you want to know, uh, you need to bounce everything off the Word of God. And it's important. Listen, before you, sp listen to me. Before you s step into, into a new spiritual arena, make sure that you check that, what that arena means in the Word of God. Because God will always give you his directions on the front end. God's not going to tell you to go do something and then change it halfway through, is he? No. He's just going to give you a direction, okay? And then another, there's a, and there are those teachings now that are not, where it's popular to say that God doesn't give you direction. Because a lot of churches want, they want you to, freelance in your Christianity they don't they don't they teach you that God just sets your spiritual life in motion and then it's up to you to figure it out from there but that but when you when you take that at and it sounds good when you say it from a pulpit and you have people that want to hang on to themselves more than they want to hang on to the Lord. But that would imply, if that, if that uh, assertion was correct, that would imply that all Christians always think correctly. Do they always think correctly? No, I don't. And that Christians always think according to God's will. And do Christians always think according to God's will? No, I don't. Okay? Because that type of teaching does not take into account our old nature. And... Romans 7, all you got to do is read Romans 7, and you read of this continual spiritual battle in the life of Paul. Whenever you think you got it all figured out, read Romans 7, and then tell me that you got it all figured out, because Paul didn't have any idea. You know, when God spoke to Mo Noah, I'm talking about specifics. When God spoke to Noah, 
He knew what size to build the ark, what type of materials to use when he built the ark, and how to put it all together. Okay? When God spoke to Moses about how to build the tabernacle, he knew every itty-bitty detail. Specifics, specifics, specifics. When God's talking to you how to do something, he'll lead you specifically how to go, where to go, how to respond, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you can think of Abram. God said, go to the land, I'll show you. Now, that's not very specific, but it required faith. And God did say, uh, I will show you, okay? That's, and his, that, that's specific in its own way. I will show you. He, 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 and, and God gave Abram enough direction to get where he wanted him to go, correct? Correct? He, did, he get, did get him to where he wanted him to go. So, the Holy Spirit gives clear directives in your life. Because, listen, God is personal. He's specific in the way he wants to. His relationship with you will be like no other relationship in the universe. Because you're different, and he knows exactly how you are and who you are. And he will, as he speaks his truth in your life, he will speak it to you in a way that you can understand. All right? Okay. Thoughts or comments? Anybody? Yes, Arlene? The Children's Ranch. Anna, Anna what's her name? LaCorey. Yep. Yep. I've told you. I've told you this story before. In Chuck, in Clovis, New Mexico, Chuck Galicus, who was a construction worker, had a dream. It was in black and white. At first, he really couldn't make out what it was. As time, as he prayed to the Lord to reveal that vision to him, it became more and more clear. After a while. It became in color. And in that vision, there were seven church steeples and there was a church house built on top. So he said, well, God wants me to start a Christian school in this community. He's a construction worker. He has a friend who's an educator. He goes to her. They go to every church in the community. You know how many churches gave to start that school? Seven. Seven gave seed money. They talked to over 25 churches. Seven gave seed money. Specific. Yeah. God's specific. God will show you. God wants to be miraculous in your life, you know? If he's not miraculous, who is he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've experienced that, too. Yeah. <laughs> God, God, God is like that, you know. He, he knows exactly what you need. Yeah, Gord. Amen. Amen. God is good. All right. Anything else?